As I said, we changed the program as we had cancellations. And, uh, but I think it's quite good that we now have that situation that we all are role models. And I think you're absolutely right. All of these lecturers today, they all are role models. And uh, it would be, it's just fair that we half full panel, because there are some um, already missing as they uh, had to leave earlier, that we talk about role models and what your experiences are. And I would like to um, start with you, Christine, because you just said you were exhibiting heroes. And I thought, that's nice, heroes as opposed to stars. Because I think heroes could be very silent. They, you know, my grandfather was a hero for me. For example, so I think that is quite a nice um, yeah, way of putting it that we, if we look at heroes instead of role models, because I thought, I thought that is, is a good description um, that might sort of open up um, a more flexible way of looking at it, who is the role model. But if you're a, a hero, I think it's a fun thing as well. So who is your hero? <laughs> I think it's great that you differentiate between star and hero, because I really hate the word star architect. I think it was really initiated by journalists, and uh, I see it as a negative word. And most of the star architects, I don't know, my maybe beside Foster, uh, don't want to be known as star architect. Oh, okay, it's about hero. Um, could be a silent one. I have spontaneously two heroes in architecture. I don't know if you know both. One was John Hayduk, somebody of you know him, Dean of Cooper Union. He, uh, in New York, he, there was John Hayduk and it was uh, Philip Johnson. And they, they could not be more opposite than they were, but John Hayden for me was, has such an integrity and a vision, and he knows that he, he was a, actually the longest dean in the history in the United States still, but he was a wonderful person combining a great honesty, a vision, and he was uh, the dean of Cooper Union and teaching and giving his idea what the, they have to take care of the students. This was more than any other uh, architect or professor did, as far as I know, because it was combined with an incredible personality. Tall guy, big, deep voice, so he was really, for me, fantastic. Another person you sure you know is Alvaro Siza. Uh, we did the first exhibition with him, actually in 1982. And we had the last, and we love in our work to follow the architects, what they're doing. And we had the last show last year on his Alhambra, there was an Alhambra competition. He won what he never expected. It will not be built, but we, we, showed, we showed this project. And that, at that time, Alvaro is also a very silent person. He, was, he broke his arm, this, which was a disaster, because he's drawing day and night, more or less. Yeah? So uh, it was only the half Caesar, and we said hello to him. We we'll visit him in Porto. And we said, no, we don't want to ask him for any exhibition. And suddenly we, we were some, saw some drawings at the wall, didn't know what it is, and said, hey, what is that? And this was the Alhambra project. And he was so excited. He's burning for his idea. And he is 
Okay, you can tell a lot about it, but he is also really my hero. Do you have and any Sarah. female heroes? And Saha. <laughs> and yesterday, this was interesting. There's a little show on Saha here upstairs. And uh, in the book which uh, Peter Petrus Small did on this, uh, there is also an interview or a talk we both had on Saha. But yesterday, there were some comments when we saw the little show. Oh, Saha. Mm. No, 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 no. I have to say, in these 37 years, she is one of the most honest, loyal, fantastic, gifted person I met ever in architecture. And that she, uh, so she is my role model, so you have my number one. And uh, yeah, because when, I, when we did the first exhibition so many years ago, and she was so, oh, she, we had to sit the whole night, and she wants to change everything. And when we ended up after 12 hours, it was exactly as we did it before. So then I said, why? And I said, Saha, why you are such a bitch? This is impossible. Yeah? And she said, oh, very sorry, I did not realize, but I have to be like that. I have to be like that in London, with Foster, with Grimshaw, with all the architects, a woman from abroad. And if, if you remember, the first five years, even when she won uh, the peak competition, everybody said, everybody said, oh, she is, can do wonderful drawings, yeah? But she's not an architect, remember that. And she is such a brilliant architect and also so intelligent. I, finally, you can like it or not, but it should not depend on the personality. And if, uh, and she also, last thing, what I think is very important. There are people, architects, whatever, when they talk, with when they want something and they talk, and then they are, oh yeah, I do everything. And to people who are below them, they are very nasty and angry. Saha lost a lot of competitions because she was frank all the time. She lost the competition in Düsseldorf, now I stop, but it's important because, because of her integrity, she was, did not agree with that. And then, uh, Frank Gehry got it. And then he called me and said, please, can you explain, Saha, that this was not my fault? <laughs> and I, I said, I don't know how it was, but I can explain it. So I love straight, fighting women. Otherwise, we would not survive in our business. And I think it's not necessary that all of them are nice, wonderful, friendly, she is loyal, she is great, and she's honest. That's what I, I think that um, once you start believing in yourself and your projects, you become fearless. Um, because it is bigger than you. It's, you lose the fear of pers you know, pursuing that, that goal. And I um, wanted to address you, Susanna. You said that, well, you, you started sort of new frontiers with this participation and just really putting it into the public and in Germany. And, um, and you said in your lecture that you weren't taken serious. And people started saying that you were lazy or did, just didn't fulfill your, your duty as a teacher. Um, how, how would you say, what, when does, where's sort of the tipping point where you become a role model, where you've been doing the things you wanted to do for such a long time that you stand for something and then you, bec you could become a role model for a certain approach. I mean, I'm happy if I do influence um, or inspire people to r really work with um, the future users of the architecture. And at university, I noticed that there were mainly um, women, women who t took my courses, but I guess it might have to do also because um, our programs were often schools or even kindergartens. 
And yeah, in the office as well, we are more women than male colleagues. And what is your role model? What's your hero? Who's your hero? <laughs> Who's for influencing me, the, you? Uh, for me, role model and hero again is quite quite a difference and I'm not sure whether I really do have heroes but I have a few people who influenced me a lot. Um, one of them is Ron Heron from Archicrum. He was one of my teachers at the AA and from him I learned and also from Will Alsop I must say I learned to be brave <laughs> and to really fight for your, th um, for your desires and have a dream and try to follow it up. And what is just amazing with his career, he was, I mean, Archicram, everybody knew Archicram. They went around the world, they influenced so many people. But Ron wanted to build. He really wanted to make buildings. And he hardly ever had the chance. He even went through uh, to the authorities to be the city architect, to have a chance that way, to be taken serious and um, to be able to build. And he sort of um, inspired me and enforced me to go my way and take the difficult way as <laughs> and don't try to find the easy way out, but to follow the... And for the women, from Louisa Hutton, for example, I, I, was, I really learned how to experience architecture, to, to understand architecture from moving in thoughts and your imagination through it. I never ever heard anybody else so closely to with all the sensations, um, yeah, bringing the uh, experience of architecture um, further. Uh, Fabienne, we had, we had a little <laughs> discussion in the, uh, in the last break about access to power, whether we can actually not talk about this during the day, um, talking about uh, women in architecture. So it is still a matter of access to power. Who is making decisions? And we have Anna Ramos in a position and Christine Feirer is in a position and all of you actually are in positions of power, more or less. Um, how do you deal with that? Is it something you, is that something you were gaining for? Is it something you're aware of? Is it something you want to have more of? Is it the influence that, um, that will change the way women will be able to uh, have 50% have of the architecture world? And I mean, you know, as, as you said, it's not there yet? Well, it's a big question, but um, yes, of course. I mean, power is important, and it's the question where you sit. Do you sit there where you decide about the budget? Who, how is the money is spent, for instance? Um, what is being done, for instance, in your school, like, let's say, more structural um, changes or programs that are being initiated or followed or students that are being promoted. So I mentioned before our design department. So people are saying uh, that uh, because they're only male professors, they are mainly promoting male students. I don't know, this is what I'm being told, for instance. So this has all to do um, with power. I was lucky that I was promoted. I was just thinking of my own career that um, I, I had always strong women promoting me, for one exception. Um, the exception was Case Christianza, so he's very important to my career, so he's not a woman. <laughs> but the other one is Beci Franza, she was before here on the screen, and uh, the other one is Monica Muna in Lagos. So I experienced that, that women were being promoting um, uh, women because they were sitting or are sitting in a powerful position, and Beci Franza is uh, she's now sort of in the way being retired but she was heading the whole department and she had that much power and she was so much respected that she could force things uh, in the slum upgrading process that were close to being illegal uh, because she was forcing for instance construction firms to hire good architects because she wanted to have also poor people let's say 
having good architects, a good architecture, and the department under her was in all the key positions she would put ladies, and all her assistants were actually ladies, I was one of them. So, um, yes, of course, this changes a lot, it changes everything, and my last thing would be the question you asked her, actually. The thing is, what happens to your brain? I was educated mainly by men, um, by, uh, by interesting men, also gay men, by the way, I think that also changes something. And when you're sitting there as a, as a student, as a female student, and you're only being taught by, by, by men, I think you automatically, you think your, your brain, because it's what your brain is going to sort of scan, uh, only men can do the job. Because you only see men uh, giving lectures, you're only having men as guests, Craig, and they would lie in the chair like that, and then they would <laughs> take their pen and they would you know, draw in your plans, they would cut your models. And I think your brain is going you know, to, to sort of uh, realize that you're going to see that and you think, oh, this is not for me. You know, I mean, only men are here. We have here 50% female students, but only men are actually you know, taking action, speaking. And so the, the, it's not about numbers, but the female attitude, the female positions, the female perception is completely missing in this. And this is the problem we have, especially in the German-speaking countries. I think other countries are here a bit more advanced, but in the German-speaking countries, we have this problem very, very strongly. So, uh, yes. I would, I would just pass on to you, Verena. Um, the glass ceiling was mentioned today. Is there, um, in universities, in the academic world, I know it from other professions, not, not architects, that um, friends of mine who are professors, they, at a certain point of um, access to a, a level, there is a glass ceiling. And it's not something that's talked about lo a lot. It's not talked publicly, but there is a glass ceiling in a way. Do you confirm? Is that something you, you experience? Is, there's, is there something where you say there is a, there is a limit ac limited access to... Um, positions in academics yeah yes yes um, I think so but I don't think that it depends on capacity or ability but on time I have a young colleague in urbanism she's maybe 40 I would say <laughs> something <laughs> 10 years younger than I am for sure and she has two or three children, and she's really struggling, and she cannot make meetings, cannot have meetings after three or four. She's extremely under stress to, to have all her meetings. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's challenging. And if you don't have people at home who do the work, partners, assistants, whatever, how, uh, slaves, slaves sometimes. If you no, I mean, so, so this is, so this is, um, so I think there's a limit, but not in the way you were maybe asking for. But it's my, it's my personal experience that there's maybe not enough time. I think that your answer is even better than my question, <laughs> <laughs> because I think it's very true. That, uh, for example, in, in uh, the government in Copenhagen, they decided they don't have any meetings after four o'clock because they found out that they could um, have far more women working there if all the, the important meetings will be in the, in the mornings because then they can pick up their kids at school after four. So um, I think that is slowly changing in certain countries, <laughs> maybe not here as um, quickly as we want it. I didn't ask you for your influence, so I would like to ask you and also Fabienne and you, Anna, just one person, who, male or female, who influenced you. Can I? Okay, I have two answers. <laughs> one is that for a long time I couldn't find an answer to this question because if you have an interview, they would really like to ask you, who was your teacher? 
Who are you referring to? Who influenced your work as an architect? How can you know? I mean, but now, as I'm getting a little bit older, I can see three persons, at least. So one was a, a teacher at school. This is an experience I share with a close friend of mine sitting in the audience. And this was someone who, when we were like 16, 17, 18, attracted us as a tutor, because we were about choosing, you know, a kind of Vertrauenslehrer. And I think this was an experience that really influenced our lives, because he took us so serious as individuals, but also as a group. And what came out is that almost every one of us went her or his own way, more hers than his in this case. And on the other hand, that we stay being friends, which is so such a quality after 30 years or 35, I don't, I don't know. So the second one was Otto Steitler. This one was a music and um, philosophy teacher, so it had nothing to do with architecture. He became a professor later on. And the second one was Otto Steitler, who was not present in the first years of my studies, but we really admired him. He was such a figure, such a character, and when he was there, we were really like having more than two ears listening to him, and we, we talked about it for weeks, if we had one hour of, yeah, really interesting. And the third one was, is still is Adolf Krishanitz. I was a teaching and research associate with him, and it was so great learning from him while teaching myself, and he taught me in a way that you can be really ambitious about architecture, but it's very important that you always keep a distance to your own, you know, ambitiousness <laughs> or ambition. And that's a very complicated thing, and he argued with um, the arts, where he said, for example, I think he was citing Donald Judd, that every piece of art is a kind of representative of all, all works of art that exist. So there was a kind of challenge about thinking that you don't work and work and work until there is the result of what you're working on, but that you might shift and change your attitude and give it to someone else and work and so on. So that was really interesting. And the second answer, I, I don't. <laughs> Fabien, would you like to answer? About the role models. I don't know what it said. Interesting. I mean, on a very personal note, my daddy for sure, because, but I had no brother. So I'm, anyway, I was the only daughter. And my daddy was a designer himself. And I think I'm, I am like I am because of him, because he told me basically to, you know, in a nutshell, like, you know, there is this guy and there is stars and this, this is what you can reach and you can do it. And he, he never told me, you're a girl or you're, you're a woman, you cannot do that. Uh, the opposite is true, he was promoting me till the end, till he died. So I think that's probably the most, that was the key figure, I think. I wouldn't be like that if, and he was, as I said, he was a designer, shoe designer. So with Bali, so you had still these wonderful machines, the shoe production. So she, he would take me there, he would show me the machines, he would... Uh, even commission uh, drawings and paintings for his studio and um, he was also quite ambitious so I had to deliver beautiful paintings. <laughs> Probably that's why I am like I am. So no, I think it's really my daddy and then throughout my career at different figures during my studies I was obsessed with Rem Kohlhaas. I would read everything he did and said and and then, you know, this phase was over. Case Christians, as I said, but he was with Rem Colas as well. So I think different figures, but also, um, for instance, I think no one will like this answer, but Angela Merkel, she's for me, I think she's a fantastic uh, um, um, person, uh, woman, and I think what she's doing, the way she is um, governing, the way uh, she's putting her teams together is absolutely unique and I'm sure she did more for, the, for women than, every, than anybody can, can, can estimate right now. I think she's really fantastic, for instance, that's also a person that has nothing to do with architecture. So, and also figures in literature, Simone de Beauvoir, you know, these things you read and, uh, yeah. Anna. My second. Um, let me <laughs> ask Anna first, and then yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Ah, lucky you that your politicians, you, you can feel proud of them. Because at this time of my life in Barcelona, I cannot be definitely proud of any of my politicians up there. Uh, I also had a father. I also have a father who was, we are only daughters, and he was also pushing us like if we were, we, we were raised as if we were ki boys, I think. Like, yeah, no limits and take it, it's for you, and you have to, actually. It's not that take it, but go and take it. Um, I learned from a colleague, a professor, an old woman who was the second woman who studied architecture in Barcelona. Uh, she was an old professor and we were sharing office when I started my uh, part-time associate um, professorship and we were sharing the office. And she was at that time 63 or something. She had five children. She was divorced from an architect who, you know, led her with the five children. They were partners and then he went with the young partner of the office, these things that happened when she was about 40. And she was able to keep on running the office on her own, to keep her professorship and never be kind of ashamed of being a mother, a grandmother. And, you know, it was such a contrast with other female roles, female role models I could see in the 90s or in the 80s that pretending not having a personal life and being always, you know, perfect and, yeah, like impossible superwoman. And she, she was not pretending to be a superwoman, but she really was. And the sad part of the story is that everyone was talking about her like, oh yes, Professor Jimeno, oh yes. You know, like, oh yeah, because she was kind of humble and not, not pretending that she was the best, just having her little office with her little commitments, whatever, but we all know that bringing an idea into a real building that's being a hero, and she was doing that every day and being kind of put apart by all the other male professors because she was the only woman professor for a long, long time in the university, in the 70s, in the 80s. And, and I really think she inspired me a lot. Like, of, uh, we have to be like, like post-superwoman. I don't know, we, we, we are what we are, and uh, we try to do our best like everyone. Yeah, like they do. So I, I would point her as my role model, yeah, my hero. Verena, you wanted to add something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was a second. When I was thinking about the idea of a role model, I was thinking if a role model could also be a younger person. Why, sure. why would it Absolutely. also... Absolutely. Your daughter, yeah, yeah, yeah. your, your son, why your whatever. I'm, I wanted to add it because everyone mentioned mm -hmm. an older person. And... Um, in order to prepare a little bit for today, I read for the second time um, a small essay by Shima Manda Ngozi Adichie. You might know her. She's a Nigerian writer. You know her, of course. But I started reading her texts eight years ago because I myself went to Lagos several times for different reasons, but we could have met. <laughs> we, we <laughs> on. Yeah. And then um, I discovered an amazing group of young female writers. Mm -hmm. Most of them were Igbo. So in Nigeria, there are three main ethnic groups, like Yoruba, Hausa, and Igbo. The Igbo is the, this people who created the state of Biafra, and as we know, they created it in 67, and it was destroyed in 1970. When we grew up, we grew up with this image of the Biafra children. And the tradition of the Igbo people is language. There's a very strong um, heritage of language. And Jinwa Achebe, who is a very important African writer, who wrote Things Fall Apart. I don't know who knows this book, but I can really recommend it. So he taught 
a, a younger generation of writers, many of them women, and Chimanda um, Adichie is one of them. She's 30 something maybe, 38, 47. 77. And she has written so amazing books. She started with something between documentary. She wrote about Biafra, Half of a Yellow Sun. Someone gave it to me, he bought it at the airport. I was going to Lagos for the first time and I, I really found out that the way she writes is so contemporary. And I was so touched by the way she writes about family, tradition, history, feelings, failures, and so on and so on. And she wrote Americana, which was quite a success, I think. And she gave a talk in 2013 or 14. And the title of the talk was We Should All Be Feminists. Obama refers to her talk. And it is printed, edited in a small book. And this is really amazing. I could recommend it to everyone. Thank you. Also <laughs> because it's so easy to read. And it's so clear what she has to say. Christine, you wanted to add something. What you said on Anna, yeah, what you said on Anna, um, I think it's an important issue because it's uh, years ago it was possible to say women they have kids, you have to take care of the kids. You have two kids, I have four kids, you have one kid, you all would get kids <laughs> in future, and uh, this can't be a reason to fight for their wishes, and in this case, okay, from now on, you are my role model, uh, because this is really important. It is not, we cannot say at the end of such a discussion, oh, we poor women, it's a, a man-orientated world, which is still true, uh, and we have to take care of home. When I was, uh, running the museum in the Netherlands, and I had 110 staff members, 95% were women, because <laughs> it was great to work with them. And actually, when I was there, I hired a woman for a position uh, who was pregnant at that time. Because I know from my experience, or experience from others, they are better organized, they are structured, as well. they have to be good, this is the base. But so I really think it's important to stress that a bit for the future. And um, I, I googled to find a really good quote. So I could not find any. All was, all was somehow existed. <laughs> so, but I, uh, there is a Kulturrat, maybe you never heard this organization in Germany. So they did an interview with me and I got the magazine before I left. And there was a quote from Simone de Beauvoir, and this is my last sentence I'm saying. She wrote decades ago, if women don't demand something, they won't get anything. I think this is great, and that's I will really believe in. Um, this is a very good... Uh, ending words, and uh, I don't know whether we want to have questions now or we want to sort of open up and have in more informal ways. What, Peter, Andrea, what do you think? Because we. I think yeah? Are you all okay with that? Also, you that you answer some questions just in one to one discussions, maybe, for half an hour or so. Thank you all very, very much. Um, for me, it was an amazing day. Um, I loved every and single one of your lectures and every single one of the panels I thought um, was very, very inspiring. Thank you all for coming. And um, yeah. <laughs>